not be afraid of speaking uh, publicly, which helped me later in life. Well, I want to thank you for being here thank today. And where were you born? Let's start with where you were born. I was born in Dayton, Ohio, mm -hmm. um, but my father um, was working in television at that time. He worked in television his whole career. And what did he do? He was a television director in Ohio when he graduated. My mother and father graduated from the University of Wisconsin, and um, his first job was uh, in Ohio, in Dayton as uh, a news, um, uh, not reporter, he, w he was behind the camera mm -hmm. and uh, for quite a lot of um, programs there. But he visited my aunt and uncle who lived in Seattle and um, my mother and father fell in love with Seattle in the early 70s and decided- They fell in love with the weather. No, well, not, certainly not the I weather, in Ohio. but it was a very, it was a very small town. It was a working class town, Seattle, okay. in the in the 70s. There was only one company, Boeing, at mm -hmm. that time, really, that was famous. And he decided that he wanted to go work in Seattle. So he looked, in those days, you, you had a, um, a magazine, um, in industry magazine for jobs, and he, f he found a job as a, as a television director in Seattle and he, he went and visited the uh, the boss there at Cairo Television and he said um, you know I want to work here and the boss said I don't know you you know you don't have any experience and so my dad went back to he that was while he was in Seattle visiting my dad went back to uh, Dayton and printed off a poster size of his resume and sent it to to this guy and he was laughing so hard. He said, okay, come back, I'll give you a shot. So my parents moved to Seattle when I was one. So I didn't have a chance to grow up in Ohio. Okay. I grew up in Seattle. Right. So that's what I consider my hometown. There you go. Yeah. See, I went to Seattle only once because I brought over the pre-core, the first pre-core equipment. They mm -hmm. became famous. You know, familiar with them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The home of Roy yeah. machines and yeah, stationary yeah. bikes. So I brought them here first Okay. in Japan. And I wanted to get the exclusive. They didn't give it to me. They gave it to someone else. Okay. And that guy went bankrupt. Uh-oh. It wasn't because of Precor. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's because of the way he was trying to run the business. I see. But I met Precor. I went. That was my first time in Seattle. And it was very interesting. I stayed at the Four Seasons. Okay. And it was nice. It is a nice. It's, it's a nice downtown. Nice, as well, nice. it used to be very nice. It's a little different yeah. now. But yeah. It was very interesting. Seattle was very interesting. Anyway, so you grew up there. What was it like for you growing up there in Seattle? Um, I was very lucky. Um, I, both of my parents worked. Um, I was an only child from my mom and dad. They divorced when I was eight, but uh, we had a, a big home and lived right next to a park where I could go down to uh, ride my bike to the ocean. It was, it was really nice. Um, and it was, it was a time in the 1970s in Seattle where there weren't that many kids. We we're sort of the I'm Gen X, but you know, there was right. this Baby right after the boom. So there weren't that many kids in my neighborhood, but there were some, and uh, you know, we all got together and played sports and rode our bikes everywhere. And it was a, it was a good city for um, being outside for sure. Right. So the mom and dad broke up when you were about eight. You said yeah. So did you stay? Who did you stay with? I stayed with my mom. Your mom? Yeah. And did she stay in the same place? Did you guys still stay in no, Seattle? No, we moved. We sold the house and moved into an apartment not far away from where okay. I grew up. And um, my dad moved, was still in Seattle, but moved uh, to a different part of the city. Mm -hmm. Did you get to see him often? Yeah, a couple times a month we would spend time together, okay. uh, usually on the weekend. Or, you know, he would come see me play baseball or basketball sometimes. And so, did you have any favorite sport in elementary school, in elementary school starting off? Uh, I loved baseball and basketball. They were opposite seasons, so I could be playing uh, all the time. I was a bit small for American football, um, <laughs> to be fair. I mean, people were much bigger than me, but I did well uh, playing basketball and baseball. But I think it, baseball was probably my best sport. Is that right? was, yeah, what was position? Pretty, I was a second baseman and a shortstop. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. I, did, I did enjoy it. So, did you, What about academics? How were you academically? Um, I was really good academically um, in 
you know, through school, I, I, f I was not really happy with authority, I would say. Um, Studying when? Uh, probably high school, like a lot of people, junior high and high mm -hmm. school. Um, you know, with a single mom, it's easy to not want to follow the rules. But I didn't have to work that hard to do well in school. But I also didn't really like studying or, or want to um, listen to what school had to say. Like, well, like a lot well, of kids. How are mom and dad now? Is mom, mom and dad still doing okay right now? Yeah, they're both they're both alive. They're That's both good. remarried um, mm. and doing well. Actually, my mom and that part of my family and I and my wife are going to go to Hawaii in November to see everyone. That's they're you know they're getting up there in, in age, so it's. It's not no way. Hold yeah. it! You just told me how many it is. No, they're not. No, they're not. You guys are still looking good. Yeah. Right. Both of them the same age? Are they the same age? My mom's a little bit older, but yeah. Oh, really? Same age. Okay, yeah. all right. Because yeah. you told me your dad's 70, right? Seven, well, that's not true. He's 77. Oh, he's older than I am. Yeah, my mom has turned 80 this year. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. I was thinking this last time we went traveling together in the 70s. So. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Is he, well, the pictures I saw, I think the last picture I saw of you and him on your Facebook was 2022. Yeah. yeah. Um, he, was, he was on Facebook, and mm. then... Um, I'm not sure why he decided to leave Facebook, but mm -hmm. he's not on Facebook anymore. Right. So he used to update a lot of things. I think the politics of um, Facebook was, is a turnoff to a lot of people. Right. So if you post something, someone posts back. I think he's just was done with it, and which is understandable. But I, all of my pictures are still up from our travels. I see. We he is fascinated by Vietnam, and so was he? Did he go? Yeah, and with so, branch. Um, I think he was in the army, okay. um, but we didn't really talk about that. But he was when we went to Vietnam. Uh, you know, he was very apologetic to the people. That's you know one of the reasons we first went there. It was sort of an apology tour. I think in his own mind. Well, he was a grunt then. He was yeah. enlisted. Yeah, he was enlisted. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, he was one of the grunts then. Yeah, he he saw some stuff. I was drafted my first year in college, mm -hmm. and I knew I'd go to Vietnam, so I enlisted into the Air Force. Oh, okay. I tested the Air Force. Yeah. I figured even if I went to Vietnam, I'd be on a base. All right. <laughs> you know, so, so, but, and ironically, I mean, really interestingly, that's how I got to Japan, putting in for Vietnam. Right. When they were having the worst time, they needed people in my career field to take care of the bases mm. while people were evacuating. So I voluntarily put in for Vietnam, and they said, we got our quota of people in your career field, but we can give you Japan. That's and I said, that's pretty interesting. I said, I'll go to China. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've <laughs> heard that 70s. before, going back to America. <laughs> yeah. I'll go to China. Go to China. So I said, yeah. what up there? And it was, that's what kept me, that's what brought me here, and I'm really thankful to my uncle, Uncle Sam. Wow, yeah. that's it. I've heard that story a few times in, yeah. in Japan. Um, and a lot of people that came over during that time are still here. And uh, it's hard to leave paradise once you find it. Yeah. And it, and I think it takes a certain mindset. But all of us, I think, if you come here, you develop a stronger, I think, sense of loyalty and and love for your own country. Mm -hmm. But it's like being raised by abusive parents. For me, mm -hmm. I love them with all my heart. I'll protect them. Won't let anyone talk about them. But I can't live with them. I feel that deeply. Do you really? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. Every time I go back, it took me about 10 years. Mm -hmm. Why am I always so tense every time I'm here? I just, mm. but I love it. It's there are, there are, there are, there I mean? are aspects of the United States yes. that are unique and wonderful and amazing. And also after a week or 10 days, you realize why you don't live there anymore. That's what it takes me to about mm -hmm. a week. Mm -hmm. For 10 days, and I'm good. Right. That's yeah. enough. Yeah. And I know now, if I go there for about a week, I'm good. Yeah. And because I just don't want to stay inside. Yeah. You can go to nice places. Like yeah. you can go to a club, like we have yeah. this club. Yeah. You can go to places like that in the States. But I want to see what's outside. Right. But no, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I do, but I don't. Yeah. I agree with that. I agree with that. It's interesting. I remember in the 80s, it was just people were afraid of people of my complexion mm -hmm. in 70s and 80s. That was cool with me, because when I walked down the street and there was a 
let's say I'm in New York or something mm -hmm. on one of the small avenues, and there are people coming at me, they'd cross the street. It mm -hmm. was nice. But after Colum Columbine, mm -hmm. and those bad things happened, people were afraid of everybody. They're afraid, yeah. Rightfully afraid so, of to be everybody. fair. Everybody. So yeah. that's what I see. Everyone's yeah. afraid of everyone. They say hello, but it's with the kind right. of like, please don't hurt yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you ever feel that? You feel oh, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, it's in the back of your mind when you come, right. when you live in a safe place like here, your spidey sense comes back after a few <sighs> days in the U.S. and you don't look people in the eyes. And I don't like that part of it. But then I look at the, the fun parts of the U.S. having very unique cities, visiting unique cultures and different places doing road trips, things that you can't really do here that are really fun and exciting. And, you know, uh, there there are many things about the U.S. that are great. But the underlying fear of where you are or who you look at or where something could happen outside of your control is very real. And I think we feel it more deeply because we live in a place where you can leave your wallet or your bag and on a chair and no one's and gonna they, touch it. Yes, and if they do, they're running to give it to you. Right. <laughs> and that's you know, there there are and the other thing about living in Japan as an American is healthcare. I mean, this is something that non Americans don't think about as much, right, but growing right. up um, You had the cows I'm sure you're under Kaiser, weren't you? Uh, we were under Kaiser. Prob I'm, My father I, had us under Kaiser. So. I don't remember what the the healthcare was, yeah. but it wasn't great. Okay, we and, had a really great one. Yeah, My father it, well, took um, care of his and it was always a concern of, you know, do you go to the doctor? Or, you know, do you? Right. You know, when when does that happen? So, and that that fear of if I get injured, do I take an ambulance or right, right, get right, a taxi right. cab or go into the hospital and in having to sell your house to pay off those bills is something that you don't have in Japan. That's right. And I think that is the safety and the healthcare for Americans is, is such an, a huge benefit here. Huge benefit. Well, I think any country that has that, for example, yeah. I think Canada has the same Canada, thing. Most Canada. countries do. It seems like yeah. we're the only ones that still tax our citizens no matter where they go in yeah. the world. I, know. And, I mean, I think, so many, I think there's only four <laughs> countries in the world that still do that. And we're one of them. And we're not represented. <laughs> you know yes, what I mean? You know. Yeah, what does it get you? We pay taxes without representation. You go to the embassy and they say, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> especially if you're an American citizen. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't like that part at all. <laughs> not a fan. It's very interesting. Okay, so you go through high school being, I mean, elementary school, and you like baseball, you yeah. like basketball. What did you get into when you became a little rebellious in your high school? So, um, I didn't make the baseball team in high school. That was that was the, my first failure in life, I think, um, and it was really painful to me. And um, I made the JV team, but I had a big ego, and I wanted to to out of the box be, be a star. Mm. And so my mom said to me, "Well, you've always liked um, theater and acting. Why don't you join the acting club?" And um, there are a lot of girls there. I said, well, yeah, that's true. And so, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And there were. You're a cool mom. And, <laughs> and I did. And um, I was very good at it. And it was really um, a fun part of my high school life to um, be an actor. And it changed my life in a lot of ways to, to allow me to stand up in front of people or not be afraid of speaking uh, publicly, which helped me later in life being uh, a founder and raising money and speaking to investors. And, you know, for a lot of people, it's difficult to uh, stand in front of people. And they say, they say, the people fear speaking more than they do death. I've the seen that. People, I've seen the, that, the, the, that, the that people, reaction. The fear speaking more than they would the idea of dying. Right. Let me ask you this, Joshua. When you were acting, did you do more theatrical type stuff or were you comedy? What did you enjoy doing most? Um, when I started, um, it was it was basic, you know, learning how to act. So a lot of that is comedic, physical comedy. But then as the years went through high school. We did more dramatic uh, works. I think I preferred comedy. I enjoyed seeing people's reactions to 
the way I was on stage um, that fit my personality better. Um, and it was, you know, it was rewarding um, to have people come up afterwards and say, I didn't know who you were, but that was amazing. You know, there's 3,000 kids in school or something. And that's right, that's oftentimes, right. you know, know everybody. But that was really, that was really nice. So I didn't pursue it later in life, but I, you know, I would say that it had one of those pivotal moments of something that lasts through your career. And, you know, much later in life, I, I worked for Microsoft and, um, that was your first job. That was my first from college. Yes, that was my first job. What did you graduate college. with from college? What kind of degree? Uh, English lit. And where'd you go to college? Uh, UW and University of Texas, and okay. then finally Western Washington. So, did like a work study at Dell okay. for a year, and then when I decided, did you do that? When you were what? A junior. A junior. Okay. Yeah. Junior. And then I realized that I didn't want to work in hardware because it was terrible. So mm -hmm. then I went back, finished my degree, and got a job at Microsoft in Seattle. Worked there for a couple of years. Actually, Melinda Gates was my boss, Bill's wife. And did you you got to meet her? And talk oh yeah, to her yeah. She was. I mean, my boss's boss. But while they were married. Was, while they were married. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I was there when they got engaged. She was walking down the hallway with this giant diamond ring on. Was like, Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was the first time that there was real security at the the office when she when they got in. You know married then they started to be like quite careful who was entering and exiting but um, my product was called Microsoft pregnancy and child care and I was a young man I didn't you know we didn't really fit into what I was doing but um, we had a core part of this product that was very similar to what WebMD is now it was predictive analytics on you know what happens if CD-ROM version, right? If something, if you feel this, it could be this. And we got two years into the into the product, and then the lawyers said, said "No, you you can't release this. This is we'll get sued." Why would you be? Sued? Well, because if what you recommend or what you say might be an issue with someone that's pregnant, oh, I see, I see, I see. Uh, you know, yeah. it could be a problem. So we need to rip that out of the product, which was the product, and so they canceled it. And at that point, um, I was really heartbroken. It was like my first big company. I put all this time and energy. So I called my best friend, who is half Japanese, um, and I said, where in the world do you want to go? And he said, oh, I've always thought about going to Egypt. I'm like, great, quit your job. Hung up the phone, walked into my boss's office, quit. We were on a flight a couple weeks later, traveling around the Middle East. Um, and then... No, wait, what's your age now, 25? I'm around 24, 25. 25 yeah. Okay, and then um, I fly back to Seattle after we, you know, we we do a bunch of traveling, and he went to London and we talked on the phone. He said, "Well, I'm going to go to Japan to see my father, who's still here, and do you want to come?" I'm like, "Yes, I do. <laughs> I've always wanted." We grew up together and I was like, yeah, I definitely want to come. No, he grew up in Seattle with you? Yeah, he grew up in Seattle. His mother, who is Japanese. Okay, and his um, father is American. He is American. He lives mm -hmm. here. Um, so we were best friends. So I've always been interested in Japan since I was young. And um, then I came over on holiday in uh, 1997 and uh, fell in love with Tokyo. And had a through through ticket to Thailand that was during the currency crisis of, of Thailand, which is wild in itself. But I flew back to the U.S. and I was like, I don't want to be here anymore. Work for a big company. And Microsoft was offering me other well, how jobs. How long did you stay in Japan when you came? Like three months. Just a, three months. <laughs> You mean something you just stopped in and went out? You no, stayed. Think, but, yeah. You stayed here for three months. Oh yeah. Where'd you months. stay? Where'd you stay in his With, place? Yeah, his place. Yeah. And he lived where in Tokyo? Oh, uh, he was actually in Kanagawa. Okay, like, Kanagawa. Yeah, it's not that far away. You know, right near Yokohama, right. and it was great. And I had a fun time. It had a, what you know, impressed basic. you the most? Well, tell me, what was your what were your first feelings? If you can go back to it when you came to Japan. That's an interesting question. I think. Um, you know, this is before phones, really, or you mean cell phones, cell phones yeah, cell phones, or, right. or you said people had pagers, yeah, yeah. Right. So you have pagers, right. and um, 
they just started coming out with, you know, uh, I forgot the name of the early flip phones that they had, but mm -hmm. not many people had them. But it was really adventurous. It was, you know, Tokyo, Yokohama. Um, it felt wonderful. The food was great. Every place that you went was an adventure. There was things happening all the time. But you didn't. We didn't have the internet. wasn't strong either. Internet was not strong. So um, your images did it match what you had thought you would see? Because I'm sure you did a little bit of homework before you came. And yeah, tried to find I think, as much as you could. I think it did, and okay. I think it would have been very different if they had lived in the countryside. <laughs> I probably big, wouldn't big still time. be here. You know, really? if they no. You're not I a think, country guy. I mean, I love going to the mountains to ski. But so you wouldn't bored. want to live there. I, yeah, I don't think I'd want to live. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's not me. And I don't so, you there, know, right? I, I think it was, I was, um, it was a fortuitous situation that I was um, given a place that was in the city. Right. That was exciting, especially as a young man of all these adventures. His brother was there too. And, you know, we'd go out and stay out all night and go to these crazy places. And, I, you know, I was just starstruck by everything that was happening and the opportunity and the other side of it was Japan is one of the few places that you know Americans can come and get a job that are not being transferred by their companies and so I went back and I ended up getting into the jet program and I came back over on the jet program so I did the jet program for a few years where, where, where were you sent when you came in the jet program I got really lucky I was in um, Kanagawa down in Yokohama area. Yeah. yeah, I was very lucky. I got, is, I got, that I got some, in, is that what you put in for? Yeah. Yeah, because usually they won't yeah. give you what you put yeah. in for. Yeah, so I got very lucky. Um, and I was there for a few years, and it was great. I had a great time, you know, learning how education industry works in Japan. And because of that, my friend, uh, Charlie, who's now a member, actually, at Tech, um, he... He was working with returnees um, at a school in Shibuya. And we decided that we wanted to start our own business. And so the first business that I started in Japan was with Charlie, and it's called uh, Kikushijo Academy. You and still have it? Uh, yes, it is. It still exists. It's the largest um, school for returnees in Japan. What year did you start it? 2004. 2004. 2004. Yeah. So we just had the 20th anniversary last week. Is he still your partner in the school? He runs the school. I consult oh. with the school right now. Um, I do, I'm helping bring their IP online. So rebuilding their whole infrastructure to globalize it. And it's, it's an exciting project and I'm very happy to be working with him. Is again. it just the two of you that own the school? Uh, I, I sold my part to Charlie in 2008, so he's okay. the sole owner of the school okay. now, but we worked together again after many years, and um, yeah, it's, it's going really, really well. So How many students? I think there are about 3,500 now. <sighs> yeah, and it's that is nice. out of that school, out of those schools, a, a um, high school, junior high, and elementary school accredited uh, also began. So there's another one of those on top of that. So it's, it's become a pretty big business. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm happy to see it still succeeding. Right. So outside of that, what else do you do? So in 2008, um, after I moved on from that business, I invested into a pretty famous food and beverage company in Tokyo called Devilcraft. Um, Chicago Pizza and Craft Beer. I was one of the original investors in that company. Um, I don't work there, but I supported the <laughs> entrepreneurialism of craft beer at the very beginning. That was really nice. That was about 2009, 2010. And then um, I started a few uh, advertising companies in the meantime. Those were fun, but it's a very difficult business to succeed in in Japan. What, were you what, what did your company focus on? Who did you um, the to creative get? on the creative side? So we were um, three. The, my first one was there were three of us, and um, we had a copywriter and a creative director, and I was doing sales. And we ended up doing a lot of work for Hakahodo for the most part, but um, global campaigns. But we weren't able to grab the 
actual business, it's, it's almost impossible in Japan to do that. So we were working on fun stuff, but we were always at the end of the end of the rope. So the food chain, you mean? The end of the food chain, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I realized that, you know, even though that type of business is fun, if you're unable to grow and own anything, then it's, you know, it's time to, to move on to something else. And so um, after that, I helped start um, one of the first few AI companies in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, after that, um, I started working in the entertainment industry. So, when did you start? You started one of the first AI companies. Mm -hmm. Now, what was that about? So uh, I met um, a guy named Fred, who is pretty famous, infamous in the um, AI world here. Um, we became friends. Is he a member here? No. Okay. Um, and we we had a um, a passion of of understanding data and machine learning early on. This is probably two thousand twelve, I assume twelve thirteen. And um, we were talking about what you know early AI could look like or how it could be used, and so. We decided to start a business um, that has been renamed to something else now. It's still going, but it's not um, yours anymore. It's not mine anymore. Okay. I I moved back to the U.S. for a little bit, mm -hmm. um, and it it was too early, I think, for the concept. This is two fifteen, didn't you? Two, no, that was about two thirteen. Two thirteen, wow. Um, because there was we were we were we were showing ideas without a product. It was very difficult to um, find a way to use. It was almost like Web three, in a way, because Web three um, is always a solution looking for a problem, <laughs> and it, it, that's why there aren't there aren't many successful Web three products out there because they don't <laughs> they're looking for a problem, right? Yeah. And so this is what early machine learning or AI was really. We, we were like, hey, this stuff works. But you need clean data. You need, you know, you need all of these things to be in place, and the infrastructure wasn't there yet in order for <laughs> right. it to work. Toward, and yeah. so, you know, we approached Coca-Cola, for example. We had this great idea, like, what if we do dynamic pricing with all of your Coke machines, and we'll check the temperature and all of this data? And they're like, we love it. How do we do it? And we're like, we need the data. And they said, it's all on paper. <laughs> we're like, well, you had all these nice scanning. <laughs> we're not like, happen. well, and that's just kind of how, you know, in the early days of you're gonna of, have. To, so you work with those companies. You come to Japan, stayed here for three months, four months, three months, three months. The original three time. months. Then I came back. And that that. But was, did you meet your wife while you were here? That three those three months. No, I I met her in COVID. So, so this is just recently. Yeah. So, wait, so you didn't get married too late, or yeah. were you married before? No, I didn't get married too late. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. And you have children now? I do not. I have a dog. Okay. He thinks you know. You're not. He's, oh, I did uh, see him. <laughs> he's, he's a um, cocker spaniel. Yes. That's he's, right. I saw. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's our. He's our. That's the family. But you have only one. Only one. Our house yeah. is not that big, so right, it, right. he's taken over the whole house, and we have a little. Sliver that we live in. Right, right, right. <laughs> That's pretty much <laughs> the way. But, but the thing is, with the dog, just nothing but love. Oh, it's amazing! You know it's amazing. I mean? Just yeah, nothing it's amazing. but love. Yeah, it's it's made our. How long have you had him? Uh, he just turned four. Okay. So this is four wonderful four. years of having a dog. Oh, you you never had a dog before. I had a dog when I was a kid. Okay. Um, but you know, for many years I didn't, and it was uh, a COVID time decision. And we got our dog in COVID. A great decision. So you want to tell people how much you spend for a dog like that? <laughs> nope. It. <laughs> it is crazy here in Japan. Yeah, it's very expensive. I mean, you're talking thousands of dollars. It's not just a th it's thousands of I dollars. I think when you, you buy know, it. I I did yeah. buy my dog, and um, I've learned since then that. A lot of people, there are shelters and places where you can you can you yes. can get dog. I would do that if I if I and when I get another right, dog, right. Uh, but I, I just wasn't aware that you could do that. So you went into mortgage and then you yeah. You so I had to, I had to 
<laughs> Got a you lease. know, <laughs> lease, lease on life. I sold some blood. <laughs> Still in debt. Yeah. Oh, that's so, nice. That's yeah. nice. You wife, has your wife ever had a dog before? No. So this is this it was, was a new experience. For it her. was a new experience, and she's great. Um, you know, she has to go to the office, and it's always a challenge every morning because she would much rather work at home with the dog, being around. Really? So yeah. Uh, so when you met your wife during COVID, mm -hmm. was did you guys meet because of business? You were doing no. Work? It was an it was you know, COVID was a lonely time, and so um, when COVID started. Um, everything, everything was closed. And, um, I live in Evis. She, at the time she was living in Megaro. Where do you live now? In Evis. Well, you live, you know, I live in Evis. No, I didn't know that. I've been living in Evis for 40 years. Well, I live right in Shima. I live right behind Western Hotel now. Oh, you live on the other Chujimai. side. I live on the west. The, but I used yeah. to live San Chome. Oh, okay. I lived there for a long time. I lived oh. in the house. Yeah. An apartment building, actually. They had the whole building. Yeah. I live on the Ichome side. Ichome side. Near, okay. in between Daikanyama and Ebis. And Daikanyama, oh, each, the Daikanyama, the Daikanyama and Ebis. That's Ichome, that's Ichome? Mm -hmm. Daikanyama, there. So I'm, I'm, I know where I'm, only, I'm only 30 seconds from the subway. From, so I'm, okay. real, I'm real. So Ebis. you're close by all that little stuff in the back? Did they yeah, the, you know where the shrine Chakyan is. Shop? The shrine. A little teeny I probably shrine. do, yeah. Yeah, I live right there. See, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a nice space. Well, but what, can, uh, there's no place you can live around here. It's not a nice place. Cause it's noisy. It's noisy. I, you know, I moved there as a single guy. It was amazing. And now I'm like, man, I lived a little bit, a little bit more out there because it's like, Party Central, like okay. Well, it was just Party Central. It, party Central. it really streets. wasn't like that when no, I moved yeah, there. Yeah. But um, yeah. so, I so people live out there, yeah. So during COVID, um, she was living in Megaro, I was living in Ebis, and I was just walking around seeing if anything was open because I was stuck at home and this is, you know, nobody really had homes set up to work or anything like that at the time. And um, I found uh, a cafe that was open, strangely. I shouldn't have been probably. And I sat down, got a cup of coffee, and she was sitting next to me. And just because it was COVID, we just started talking because both of us were just, she didn't, she'd walked from. With your mask on, of course. Yeah, from well, Megaro. No, you, but you're drinking coffee too. Yeah, so. she walked from Megaro and found this place. We just started talking and she had just visited South Africa and had, you know, all these stories about South Africa and um, started talking about apartheid. And my grandfather was, and he was the first white person to write a college textbook about slavery. And in, in, where, where, where? No, in the U.S. In the U.S. But where was he from? He, well, I mean, he was from uh, East Coast. My grandfather was okay. born um, New York, I think. Was this your father's father or your mother's my father? My mother's father. Your mother's father. Yeah, okay. Les Fischel. Mm -hmm. I think the the textbook is still being taught. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. hey, we were talking just about, you know, life and all of these interesting things. And, you know, because it's COVID, we didn't have a chance to see each other again for a few months. And then our first date was walking around Yo Yogi Park because there was nothing else to do. And then finally, you, know, you fell down on one knee. Yeah. You, you, yeah. You, said, hey. yeah. <laughs> you know, let's get a dog. And you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's, that's, that's how we already a member of tech. At that time? Um, no, I, I became a member of TAC two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. So it was before that, but not long after I became a member. Does she like member. TAC? Yes. Well, that's good. Yes, she enjoys uh, TAC well, as well. We, we both enjoy being members. Right. So where do we find you today, Joshua? What are you doing um, nowadays? Which well, year? since then, uh, you know, 2000. 15 I started working in the music industry entertainment industry. That's right. You play drums. I do um, Not right. well, but I do play drums well, you uh, play, I do you have play, you know yeah. you play well enough for them to put a happy birthday to you on one of the drums <laughs> yeah. I saw that yeah, that's, on there. Yeah, that's true um, <laughs> And it okay. actually in your music see I'm not familiar with the music the albums you like because you you even said you were gonna post an album every day or something I forget one time. Oh, but yeah. you I didn't see all that. Well, that was yeah That was one remember. of those challenges. Right, that was, right, right, yeah right. Oh, I have I have kind of music. very very varied uh, musical taste, and it it happens, you know, in cycles. I think, in some ways, um, 
digital streaming has ruined music in in a lot of ways in a lot of ways because it's too easy okay it's too easy i used to collect records and oh, yeah, I you know i'm sure you understand I that you know, my albums. and yeah. i there's something wonderful about you know hearing something on the radio um or a tape from a friend and going into the record store and digging through the crates and finding you know a 45 of a local band or you know a record that you've heard a track off and having to buy that and listening to the whole album and you know reading the liner notes and there's really something wonderful about that discovery and then hoping that you know the band comes to town or, you know reading fanzines there's a lot lost because the ease of um music being at your fingertips whether it's youtube or spotify or whatever and I, i'm disappointed in that but it also allows you to um, find more or discover more or listen to anything that you want so i understand that but i feel like music has lost a lot of its joy in some ways and it doesn't benefit the artist very much either unfortunately when i started working in in entertainment it was the tech side um, we were i started to do i tried to build a cashless payment system for music festivals um, and it failed miserably because the hardware and software melted in the sunshine. <laughs> but uh, the people that I was working with in the music festival, um, I got along with very well and ended up being on their board and for um, a company that was doing um, music for clubs called iFlyer here and did that for a few years and then we split into um, took the IP out of that and built a company called Zyco, which um, raised money for and became quite successful in the uh, ticketing and entertainment and um, IT infrastructure business, uh, which I'm still a part of. Um, but I also started my own consulting firm, um, Polyrhythm. Uh, taking from chaos comes order. You know, as a drummer, I always think about polyrhythms because okay. polyrhythms, if you hear polyrhythms, it seems, you know, if piano player, any, anyone that actually has played um, music, uh, it, it, it sounds atonal, but that's the chaos of, of founding your own company or doing your own thing, but you can bring that into order. And that's kind of what I try to consult with um, new startups that are trying to build up relationships with building a founder team and from the VC side, understanding founders, because I've been on both sides. I'm also an angel investor. So sitting on both sides of the table, having sat on both sides of the table, I understand each side and there's a lot missing between a founder trying to raise money and a venture capitalist or an angel investor investing in to a startup and trying to help each side understand each other, what the expectations are, um, I think is really important. You help these two groups, the founder and the investor, mm -hmm. get together? Yes. How do you get them to do that? I mean, you have to know one or the other. I would imagine you have to, you have to know, know the both. founder, Yeah, I, I, and, and then you have to get to know who wants to invest in it. Yeah, I, I have a very large uh, community on both sides of right. founders and um, investors in my time of networking in Japan mm -hmm. and building trust up in those communities. So I do events every quarter or so where I invite a lot of both of these people in to meet each other and I, I vet them to make sure that they're people of quality mm -hmm. to come in and, and um, see each other and get to know each other to, to, to build community. But there, I do get a lot of questions from um, new startups or people within the founder community who who want to raise money but don't know how and don't know what the expectations are once you raise money and from the um, investment side um, a lot of venture capitalists a lot of um, I wouldn't say angel investors angel investors are often um, founders too but from the VC side most come from banking and have never been a founder so the expectations around what what do founders do or what they want is often totally missing 
And so there's just an education part on both mm -hmm. sides, and um, it's not always about money. Uh, sometimes it's about trust, sometimes it's about networks, sometimes it's about helping people grow, and how do you get to the next stage. And so I really enjoy that part mm -hmm. of the journey because I've been through it, and, um, and it's tough. So if people, if, if there are investors out there or founders out there that are interested, how would they contact you? Um, I'm on LinkedIn. You're on LinkedIn? Yeah. yeah. All right, so they LinkedIn. contact yeah. you, right? I would love to Joshua meet Berry, yeah. just go on LinkedIn, they'll know you when they see yeah. you. Yeah. And then you'll, I'm sure, first of all, you want to get to know who they are. Yeah, that's the right. important part. Don't just part. become a No, it's, it's relationship right. building. It's really important right. to find out <clears throat> who, who people are, what are their goals? Mm -hmm. How can I help? How can my network help or not? You know, right. maybe maybe it's outside of the scope of what I can do, and that's also a great conversation to have. And I'm always willing to open the door to people. And I think one of the things that's helped me the most in life is never to ask but to give first. Um, I always say to people, "My network is your network. I'm. What can I do for you? I never ask for anything." at the beginning because it will always come back to you if you have that kind of open openness about who you are. Joshua, before I end the podcast, I always like to ask this question. If you could magically go back in time and meet the younger Joshua and give him advice based upon what you know now, how old would he be and what advice would you give him? I was in sixth grade <clears throat> and um, it was my dream to travel abroad. And um, especially I was interested in English history. Um, my grandfather was a historian. I was very influenced by um, him. And I was so interested in Europe, but in particular, I wanted to go to England and, and study um, English history, medieval history in particular. And I applied to, to go overseas and the company that I applied to said, there are no English families that want an American kid to come over, but how about Sweden? And I was so disappointed. I told my mom, I don't, want, I don't know anything about Sweden. Why would I want to go to Sweden? So I said no. And what a dumb mistake. <laughs> I, I, I would go back, I would go back and, you know, any chance. So it took me many, many years to have my first trip abroad. Many, many years after that, you know, in my own money. And, and you know, it, it was very hard for me to get abroad the first time. And I would go back to that 12 year old boy and go, no, you're going. <laughs> no, you're going, doesn't matter. Have a new experience in your. It will change everything the way you see life. Do it, and that's what I would do. That All that right. point, I still think about that point. I mean, I'm happy where I am now, and I I do live abroad. That was always my dream, but wow, sometimes you know everybody's got a thing, right? That's my that's your thing. That's my thing. Mm, wow. Yeah. Well, Josh, I want to thank you for being here. I appreciate thank your time. time. Same thank here. you. I want to thank all of you for watching or listening to this podcast and never forget, it's all alone. So continue to reach for the stars because you're too blessed to be stressed. <laughs> <laughs>